under cover of darkness, moving by stealth, Ninja use superb physical skill and special equipment to infiltrate and disrupt their enemies. Ninja appeared during Japan's age of regional conflict. Their origins seem to lie in small communities that honed their combat skills in mountain strongholds. Although ninja remain largely mysterious, unearthed writings have shed new light on them. This time on Japanology Plus, our theme is ninja. We will see what this secret ninja book reveals about the truth behind the myths. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus, I'm Peter Barakan. I'm in a place called Iga in Mie Prefecture, deep in the heart of Japan. This place is famous for being the home of the ninja some 500 odd years ago. Apparently most of the ninja came from this area. The word ninja conjures up images of medieval men in black lurking in shadows and performing acrobatic feats. OK, let me now introduce you to the man who's going to be my instructor in all things ninja today, Mr Hiroshi Ikeda, who does a lot of research into ninja. Nice to meet you and uh, nice meet looking you forward too. to it. <laughs> Are you yourself from this area? Actually, I moved here 20 years ago to pursue research on the ninja. My work is in Osaka, but I commute. It's 65 kilometers each way, more than an hour and a half. That's the journey I make. Oh, wow. Hiroshi Ikeda is an English teacher at an Osaka high school. For the past 25 years, in his spare time, he has done research on the ninja. Ikeda has visited sites associated with ninja and met their descendants, gathering and studying evidence. He has even tried to recreate ninja techniques that were used in the old days. Ikeda has about 10,000 items related to the ninja. By systematically compiling information, he's finding out what ninja were really like. Based in the Iga region, he works hard to uncover the deeds and the legacy of the ninja. Ninja are said to have originated in the Iga and Koka regions of Japan. These areas are surrounded by forbidding mountains and have long been worshipped as the abode of the gods. In fact, many people still come from around Japan to undergo harsh ascetic training amid this rugged natural environment. In the old days, there were about 50 villages in Iga, and they frequently fought over sparse land and water. It is thought that out of these local conflicts, the distinctive fighting skills of the ninja coalesced. It was in the latter part of the 15th century when forces of the Shogun attacked the area that a certain warrior identity began to take shape. The local fighters, once bitter enemies, now banded together. With exceptional strength, agility and knowledge of the terrain, they used guerrilla tactics to defeat the numerically superior forces of the Shogun. The victory of the Iga and Korka forces drew attention to their skills. They began to be called shinobi and ultimately ninja. Warlords in various places soon rushed to hire these superb warriors from Iga and Korka as spies and assassins. Now, this place, Iga, and another place, Korka, mm. are famous for being the two centers mm. of the ninja. Why? First of all, both Iga and Korka are surrounded by mountains. That makes them a great place for hiding out. And they were also close to the capital, Kyoto, so this was a good place to flee if there was unrest in Kyoto. And the weather is foggy. 
These are important factors that led to the rise of ninja in Iga and Kolka. And are there any traces still left from when the ninja were around? Lots. Over there are the ruins of a castle where a battle took place, a mountain stronghold. Here's the ruins of a fort. A fort? Yes. It doesn't look like a fort, it just looks like sort of grassy banks. Well, that's like a wall, and there was a moat filled with water. It was a home and a fort combined. So they had to protect themselves from, um, from who? Enemies. Enemies everywhere. They all spied on each other. So, so wait a minute, the ninja were fighting other ninja? Yes. Why? <laughs> there were factions among the ninja. This clan, that clan, the other clan. So they always had to be alert. At the time, back then, there were... 700 forts or so, all around Iga. Wow. <laughs> For a long time, almost nothing was known about how the ninja actually lived and operated. For centuries, each clan's secret arts were passed down orally. But about 70 years ago, a written guide used by Iga and Korka ninja was discovered, casting light on their way of life. OK, we have laid out before us here all the tools of the trade of the ninja. And uh, perhaps we should start off with... The, we've got a stack of books here. Now, what are these? Mm. These would have been held by high-ranking ninja. They're collectively known as the Bansen Shukai, also called the Mansen Shukai. You might say this was the ninja bible. What's contained in it? First, the right mentality for a ninja, then ninja skills, in other words, methods of attack. And beyond that, methods of infiltration and these ninja tools are all covered. Mm. Written in the 17th century, the Bansen Shukai laid out ninja skills in detail. For example, the best timing and methods for infiltrating an enemy camp. And how to make and use ninja gear. It covers other matters as well. Information about medicinal plants for healing and for poisoning. And astronomical observations, including ways to tell the time. A diverse range of knowledge and information a ninja would need is contained here in these 22 volumes. OK, we have some rather evil-looking weapons here as well. Perhaps you could talk about each of these. This one, I, I do know what this is. This is called a shuriken. Uh, that... And I, I think probably quite a few of our viewers will have seen one of these before. Mm. Um, how is it actually used? Perhaps you could just show... Well, the shuriken is the ninja's trademark item. Shuriken means blade behind the hand. You can seal it like this. And when you need to, throw. This would be for a ninja's last-ditch escape, to get away. OK, and we have this rather evil-looking thing here, which is almost like a handheld spear. This is called a kunai. You can use it like a shuriken, but also for digging, like this. And then we've got this little pile of things here. Now, that definitely looks like it comes out of nature. Yes. These are caltrops. They're actually the seeds of a plant, a plant called the water caltrop. You scatter them on the ground. Step on these and ouch! This was an escape technique called sowing caltrops. That's how you'd use them. Ah, OK, and this would be outdoors, of course, so you wouldn't be able to see them unless you were looking very carefully. These pieces of gear are all ultimately for the purpose of escape. Once a ninja has the information, unless he can escape and take it back to his master, nothing is gained. I imagine there must have been other tools of the trade apart from what we've got here on the table. Perhaps you could talk about a few other things. Well, for example, ninja were 
experts in using fire. Most famous, perhaps, was their use of signal fires. Smoke signals. In a way, that was their version of today's mobile phone. <laughs> Speaking very broadly. So, perhaps you could just explain how that worked. There were all kinds of signal fires. So they were sending up smoke, of course. They would color the smoke by using various leaves. Or they would put a lid on the fire and then take it off again at intervals. Two seconds meant OK, three seconds meant caution. Predetermined signals. So you've got one ninja over here and there's another ninja, what? A few hundred yards away, several kilometers away, how far away would you be able to see these things? I did an experiment. Oh, really? Yes. To see how far away they could be seen. And in good weather, you could see the signal from 16 kilometers away. But there's a trick to it. You don't want to burn it at the top of a mountain. You have to have the mountain in the background, so you burn the signal midway up the side. That creates a dark backdrop, and the smoke will be clearly visible from far away. I mean, the image of ninja that I've always had is they're all dressed up in black. Uh, so is that the reason why they do that as well? Well, during the day, if they wore all black, they'd stand out. They did wear black or brown at night to blend in. So what did they wear during the daytime? Sometimes they dressed as peasants sometimes as priests, sometimes as merchants, samurai, arm-seeking monks, or even as entertainers. Basically, they had seven personas and would switch between them according to the situation. So they had to be professional actors as well as professional <laughs> spies. <laughs> yes, and it went beyond just changing their appearance. If they were posing as begging monks, they'd have to master the bamboo flute because those monks played the flute. Impressive. Were there any women ninja, by the way? Yes. It's written about in this book, although not in detail. They may have been experts at the classic honeypot scheme. <laughs> OK. It doesn't matter anywhere in the world, any time in history, the same rules always apply. <laughs> OK, it's ninja training camp time now. Ikeda-san. Let's see what you can do. Let's go. We're in this forest now on the mountain, and I, I believe this is where the ninja actually used to do their training. Yes. So w what time of the day would the ninja normally do their training? According to one ninja book, they got up at 4 a.m. And all the way through until midday, they would do farm work. Afterwards, they trained all afternoon. Oh, so they do it in the afternoon. They get up at four o'clock, but they do the training in the afternoon. OK, that sounds fairly civilized. And um, what are we going to start with today? Well, think ninja and you think shuriken. OK. Plant your lower body securely, point at your target with your off hand, aim for the red bullseye, arm out straight, relax your shoulder and throw! Ooh. Like that. Now it's your turn. OK. Oh, good try. It went right in the middle, but it didn't uh, stick in. <laughs> not quite enough power. Oh! God. oh! Yeah! <laughs> it missed a target, job, but it's at, least, at least it's stuck in. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Let's say we have a moat or a river here. You have to cross the water to infiltrate the enemy base. Rope crawling like this is one important ninja skill. OK. Go for it. OK. Oh, nice job. Keep going. You can make it. Stay focused. <laughs> I've dropped into the moat then, haven't I? <laughs> the last one. Yes, here we go.
Ninja have to climb walls, don't they? Yeah. Let's work on that now. Oh my god. <laughs> Well, that was quite fun. That's day one at boot camp for me. But, you know, you have this image of the ninja scaling up walls and whew, But this is where it all happens, right? They do this training every day, day in, day out, year in, year out. Bit of an education. Ninja were most active during Japan's age of regional strife. The Iga and Korka ninja were hired by competing samurai warlords, but they were nearly wiped out when fortune turned against them. In the latter part of the 16th century, with the country in turmoil, a warlord named Oda Nobunaga arose. He conquered the territory of numerous rivals. Nobunaga controlled most of the kinky region of Western Japan, but the formidable ninja of Iga and Korka were a major obstacle to his ambitions. In 1570, Nobunaga successfully conquered Korka. And he went on to launch two attacks against Iga. The first invasion was valiantly repelled by the ninja. Nobunaga's forces lost 3,000 men. So, for the second attack, he marshaled a force of 40,000 and led them personally. The ninja of Iga had only 4,000 troops. For two weeks, they fought tooth and nail, but the campaign ended in their decimation. Later, Japan emerged from its long years of war into the peaceful Edo period. The surviving ninja were recruited by the new shogun's government and given a status equal to samurai, as well as residences in the city of Edo. They served the shoguns faithfully, spying on regional leaders. So this period turned out to be a real big turning point for the ninja. That's right. We can basically divide the history of the ninja into two periods, before the Edo period and during the Edo period. Before the Edo period, during the period of turmoil, the ninja worked on contract, if you will. Then, in the Edo period, they worked for the shogun or for regional authorities. They became like civil servants with permanent positions. For example, Hattori Hanzo Masanari had an annual income of 8,000 koku in the unit of value of those days. It's a bit difficult to translate that into terms of modern currency, but a rough estimate would be around 800 million yen. That's what he was making each year. OK, he's like the, he's like the, uh, the head of the CIA. <laughs> What kind of um, learning did the ninja have? As I see it, the ninja were educated in intelligence gathering and at the same time in survival skills. They knew what plants to gather, which ones they needed to survive, what plants they could eat, what plants were poisonous, which ones were medicinal. Botanical knowledge was very important to the ninja. So there was this botanical knowledge, and also astronomical knowledge was crucial. The time of the new moon is the easiest time to do infiltration, and they were always calculating the wind direction. This was to make sure that their scent didn't go downwind, because that could give them away. And one other thing. They were also very good at imitating animal calls to help them infiltrate. So the ninja knew quite a lot when you think about it. They were, in a way, scientists, men of knowledge. And it was all for the purpose of survival. And to function as spies, presumably, they would have had to be 
versed in psychology as well, I suppose, in a way. There's an interesting description, how to find the best time psychologically to infiltrate. For example, the time of the first tea harvest. At that time, everyone would be drinking tea and that would keep them awake. So don't sneak in then, that's what the book says. The best time is ceremonial occasions like weddings or festivals, when the enemy's been drinking booze, that's the time. And when they went spying, they would start by giving their sources gifts. Then they'd try money. And if that wasn't enough, they might even offer a pretty woman. All to win the sources' trust. Just like the spies today. <laughs> You know, I'd never realized that the ninja was so sort of multi-talented, I suppose. The image that they have probably around the world and that certainly I had for a long time was very much a sort of martial arts image. That's part of the story, but the main mission of a ninja was spying. Fighting wasn't their goal. Of course, they did fight sometimes because they were paid bodyguards for VIPs. They didn't reject fighting, but it wasn't their purpose. If they had all this knowledge, presumably, if they wanted to be criminals, it would have been very easy for them to do that as well. Was there a moral code that stopped them doing that? The first thing written in this book is that a righteous mind is essential for being a ninja. If you lack that, you're just a common thief. They're doing everything they do for the sake of their lord, so they would not normally use their skills for evil purposes. The ninja had to have that attitude in order to do their jobs. And they had absolute loyalty to their lord. Yes, that's right. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do their work as a ninja. I'm Matt Alt, and right now we're in Tokyo, almost 400 kilometers removed from the ninja homeland of Iga. More specifically, we're in Harajuku, Tokyo's fashion district. Today, these streets are lined with clothing and accessory shops, but back in time, this was the land of the ninja. The reason being, because Shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu rewarded the ninja who had helped him by giving them land in this area. That means centuries ago, ninja actually walked these very streets. And this isn't even the only place in Tokyo with ninja heritage. This is Kanda. Today, it's known for its used bookstores. But until 1932, this section of Kanda was actually known as Kogacho for the number of Koga ninja who lived here. And even today, there's one section of the area that's still known as Kogazaka or Koga Hill. Perhaps the residents of Kogacho once practiced their ninja running technique here. You never know. This is Hanzo Mon Station. It's named after Hattori Hanzo, a famous ninja who helped Shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu come to power. He lived in this area, and that's why the subway is named after him. So in a very real sense, a ninja runs beneath the streets of Tokyo even today. We're here at a certain temple in Tokyo that they tell me is home to a certain possession of Hattori Hanzo's. This way. Here it is. Wow, what, what is this? Is, is this a spear? Yes, it is the spear of Hattori Hanzo. This looks so long. How long is it? Now it's about 260 centimeters. During an earthquake about 150 years ago, about 30 centimeters of the tip broke off. During an air raid in 1945, about 150 centimeters of it burnt. It was originally 180 centimeters longer. Wow. So what you're saying is it, it used to be much, much longer. Uh, how much does it weigh? Right now, about 7.5 kilograms. I thought Hattori Hanzo was a ninja. So what's he doing with a spear? Hi. You're right that he did serve Tokugawa Ieyasu as a ninja. 
but apparently he was also famous for his exceptional skill with a spear. So Hattori Hanzo was a master of the spear, is what you're saying? Yes. So there you have it. Even in the midst of this high-tech metropolis, the traces of the ninja are still here, if you know where to look for them. And do you think there are lessons that all of us can learn from the ninja without having to get too specialised? Yes, lots of lessons, including ones in human psychology. Ninja knew how to strike up conversations and get people talking how to get people to drop their guard. They had mental skills like that. We just talked about their botanical knowledge. If we didn't have modern drugs, we'd need to know that too. Or, if you were lost in the mountains, signal fire techniques could enable you to build a fire and call for help. All those skills would be helpful today. I call the study of these skills ninjology. Ninjology? Yes, ninja studies. Okay, a bit of survival technique for all of us. Good idea. You know what they call people who have abilities in all these different fields? They call them Renaissance men. And for a lot of people around the world, I think if you say ninja, they're going to think turtles. Mm. And I don't know who created the ninja turtles in the first place, mm. but they were all Renaissance men. Mm. And I, they probably weren't aware of that image when they created them, but I think inadvertently they may have really hit the nail on the head. Yes, I myself do think that the ninja have a cool image, certainly. They also have a certain mystique. People are often drawn to things that are cool and a bit mysterious. And I think that the ninja fit that bill perfectly in Japan. Plus, they're known around the world, so I think they're a quintessential global image of cool Japan. A lot of the things that are promoted as Cool Japan, I'm not too sure about, but I think the ninja may be the real Cool Japan. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Next time, rice, Japan's staple. And it's not just something for people to eat. Rice has nurtured a unique ecosystem. We explore a crop at the very heart of Japanese food culture.